can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Welcome back. So it's, uh, let's continue. Uh, let me quickly review the first uh, episode. Uh, so we were discussing infrared structure of gravitational theory in uh, Minkowski space in four dimensions, or in more general uh, theory with massless particles, discuss the three uh, different uh, topics and their relation. And then <coughs> we focused on a simple toy model, which was the analog of this 2D, 2D, 2D Ising, which seems to capture some of the things and would be helpful when we move now to the most general case of asymptotically flat, nonlinear, dynamical space time. The toy model was that, well, we discussed the Penrose diagram, its global aspects. So we have null infinity, we have some sources, which are particles coming from, uh, say, null infinity, interacting at a point and going to future null infinity. They start in some directions specified by initial moment, momenta and end up in some final dimension. So this is just a stress tensor which enters on the right-hand side of Einstein equations. And then we solve for the metric, very simple exercise. And, uh, and we focused on, the, uh, on the, the behavior of the metric to the close to the null infinity, which corresponds. So here I wrote, uh, uh, I wrote, just, I wrote the metric of Minkowski space in retarded coordinate and an advanced coordinate retarded as uh, this u t minus r, so this is a constant u. Looks uh, the time u runs here on scry from minus infinity to plus infinity, and v, which is t plus r, which also run from uh, minus in infinity here to plus infinity here. Then we found that uh, so this kind of uh, source, which would is a typical source when we consider gravitational scattering problem, being gravitational scattering problem, we fix the initial data here and we look for the final data here. So we found that the, um, the, uh, if we focus on the value of the metric in some observational direction uh, labeled by unit vector n, uh, that the, uh, the expression was very simple. And moreover, we had this uh, overall change, which, which is called memory. And this was related in a simple way to famous Weinberg soft factor. That was uh, lecture one. Now, uh, let me uh, add a couple of comments about that. And uh, uh, first one is that notice that if you, if you observe uh, the change or this metric in some direction n on the sphere, uh, it's a very large distances. R is very large. Uh, you cannot see explicitly this other particles because they're very far away from you. They're piercing the sphere in other directions. It's like celestial sphere away from a gravitational scattering event, you cannot uh, see what's going on. We are sitting at one point on the sphere. That's where we have our detector. Nevertheless, this, uh, this metric explicitly depends on all the momenta which piercing the sphere in all directions. So uh, this effect, in a sense, is very infrared. It is sensitive to the particles which are even far away from you. It's not local on the sphere. <coughs> uh, second comment is that uh, you can, as an exercise, as a very useful, Interesting exercise, you can generalize this computation with a retarded propagator to D dimensions. And you will find that uh, in D dimensions, the picture is the following, that you have a radiation that appears at the order one over R D over two minus one. In D equal four, it's just one over R. And you will find a memory that appears at the order one over R D minus three. <clears throat> Notice when d is equal to 4, it's the same order. And this is related to many special things that happen in four dimensions. Uh, in high dimensions, these are different orders, and it also led to many, leads to many complications. Also, you can compare your result with a recent paper by Wald. Uh, where they say that there is no memory in high dimensions. Uh, but they look on at this order. So if you look at high orders, there is a memory. Okay, so these are two comments. Now uh, let us move to some interesting, some other interesting aspects uh, of this toy model, very simple one, which is namely, let us ask what is the asymptotic behavior of this metric at the boundaries of scry? So what are the boundaries of scry? The so scry is labeled by this time u and the sphere. So we can take uh, this time, uh, if we take u to infinity, let us denote it i plus plus, when it goes to plus minus infinity, we will denote this as a i plus plus minus. Similarly, on this cry minus, taking the time plus minus infinity, 
we will denote i minus plus. So this is on the diagram we are approaching this point. This is i plus minus, this is i plus plus, i minus plus, etc. So notice we started with a metric which is completely irregular in a spatial slice. You can find this metric everywhere you like. Now, uh, if you do this exercise, again, remember we have this retarded propagator, simple integral with a delta function, we can explicitly find everything. You will find a, a surprising result, which is, uh, well, maybe it's surprising at first uh, sight only, but you will find that the metric uh, on a, on a future, on the i plus minus, so if, when you approach past on the square i plus, here, is equal to the metric uh, from the, when you approach from the scry minus, which is antipodal image. So there is a flip on the sphere. That's a crucial, uh, crucial th thing. And what happens is that we have a completely, um, uh, completely smooth metric on a spatial slice, but when we take, when we go to scry plus or scry minus, we first take a limit r to infinity, and then uh, we're taking the limit, this is first, and then we're taking the limit of u going to, of, of approaching this point. In a physical space, when you're doing this order of limits, two points never come to each, close to each other. That's why it makes uh, total sense that uh, you might have thought, oh, this is completely crazy. We started with a smooth field, and now we are getting that, uh, first of all, the limit exists, so it makes sense to talk about this limit. The field takes finite value. And second of all, we find that the antipodal image. So this is a, you can explicitly compute and check in this example. Um, uh, also you can, uh, as a, well, as an exercise, as a side comment, there is a famous, uh, let me just write it, for electromagnetism. If you some, some of you like it, you can write the value of electric field similarly. Um, it takes a form which satisfies the same, uh, the same ant antipodal matching condition. So on a i plus minus, it has similar form, similar to this with the soft factor. And uh, on, the, on, the other, on the other side of, a, of a i, I naught, which is a special infinity, it's uh, the same formula, uh, which is, uh, but you flip you flip, well, let me write it just as R minus N, I plus minus. Here? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, please ask me about notations. I'm introducing so many of them. So uh, UI is this, uh, uh, for velocity of a particle, if you remember. It's a four velocity of a particle. So here we can consider sources instead of particles with a mass, some charges, which come again, come and go. And n is again observational direction, and n is a four vector, one, and the direction in which you observe. Okay, so that's, uh, that's surprising. Yeah. The, the upper? So yes, uh, this, this, this is in this, in this model, this is a result of a computation. So we started with the source, we find metric everywhere, it's completely smooth. But then you, when you take the limit first, you're going to scry, you, re, you read off the, the value of field and scry, and then you discover that uh, the antipodal image. So one of the, well, as we will review, this is one of the, I think it's a main ingredient in the paper by Strominger, which is, um, uh, I guess, realization, or that's a correct thing in general. So even though we, we, we did uh, this thing in a very simple model, uh, and as far as I know, apart from these arguments, like the, this kind of boundary conditions, they, they, they respect Lorentz invariance, and uh, they work, so they lead to correct predictions. There is no uh, really mathematically rigorous derivation of antipodal matching in a generic nonlinear problem. So if you wish this is a, at the moment in, in our general treatment of symptotically flat space-time, this will be a, 
crucial insight and all the conservations, all the conservation laws, super translation, super rotations, it will come from the fact that we match things here. So this is a really important step and this, this is called uh, antipodal matching condition. So, Sorry, I'm sorry, say again? No, I, I think that if you will, if you will specify the, some Cauchy data here, we will find that this is false. Yeah. Right, you can, you can think about it as follows, for example. Let's take a spatial slice. There is some Cauchy data. You can evolve it forward or backwards. So there is one initial data that, that is specified, that specifies everything. And now, uh, if you wish, uh, you take this initial data and you go to square plus and square minus, and in general, these are different things. But then when you move this point further and further, you discover that what survives is just the tail, tail of the metric. What, what matters for this thing is tail of the metric, which controls ADM mass, or ADF, ADM mass aspect. And it, uh, first of all, it will be well defined, and then more or less it matched in this way. I, I don't know, I don't think there is a rigorous derivation in a full general framework. I would say that it's uh, more like a correct picture that uh, Strominger got. I don't know, maybe it's, as far as, far as I know, that's, that's, that's the state of affairs. Maybe, maybe you can play this game of going from finite, I think uh, Merdad wrote a paper about going this from finite R, uh, in some case, maybe in QED, but as far as I understand, in the full general relativity, there is no uh, rigorous derivation. At the level of rigor, for example, as I will talk about Christadulu Kleinerman theorem and results uh, which are pretty rigorous. So, but it seems to be completely correct, correct picture which actually always works and lead to correct predictions. And uh, all the conser new conservation law come from realizations that this limit exists and then you have to match. So let's, uh, this would be an important, this is a Im very important point. And here in this model, again, you just can compute it and uh, verify that it's correct. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, you will not see any memory. Yeah. Yes, you will not see any memory, yes. That's a, uh, that's a, uh, so this is basically to make, making sense of this story in high dimensions, namely how do you connect to asymptotic symmetries, et cetera, is an open problem. Uh, it's, it's not done. So. But it should be all the same things uh, because the soft theorem exists. Uh, so one, one way this way, uh, one way this, for example, these connections work is that you find the Weinberg soft theorem. You see that Weinberg soft theorem exists in all dimensions, completely universal. So you know that just physically that there should be memory in all dimensions. So you go to the GR literature and you see where these things go wrong. And say, you see that either it's a subleading order, things become subtle, or, but usually then you figure out how to, how to proceed to make things work. It's, uh, so remember, so we, we found this formula, um, the, the metric uh, here that we found was decaying as one over R. Now in higher dimensions, you will find that radiation, if you have a gravity wave, it's decayed like one over R to D minus, D over minus one. But uh, this, this, this H here, which will depend as a function of U, if you compute its integral, it will be zero. Whereas uh, if you want to see something non-zero, you have to go to this order in one over R. So that's a statement. Okay, so this is the end of the toy model. Uh, 
here everything is explicit, but you see many of the things. And of course, there will be a huge non-trivial steps that this toy model and all the asymptotics and matchings, they're supposed to work in completely general nonlinear asymptotical flat Minkowski space. Okay, let me, let me introduce you to the asymptotically flat Minkowski spaces. And uh, um, let me raise this part because I feel that in the center everybody sees it better. So, um, okay. One, uh, uh, of course, one, uh, if, you, if you formulate the problem that we have asymptotically uh, flat Minkowski space, there are many subtle questions about what do we exactly mean that things is asymptotically flat and, um, and uh, what are the fall-offs on the metric which you usually um, imposed by hand by uh, uh, so that you uh, capture the correct physics. So let me first write uh, again, uh, again the metric of Minkowski space. So now I will be introduced, I will be focusing um, close to, uh, we're talking about uh, scribe plus and space time close to scribe plus. So now if we, if we, we will be talking about the most generic space time, of course the metric can be very different from, uh, from the Minkowski space. And here we introdu I introduce uh, con just coordinates on a sphere, which are uh, convenient. So Z is related to usual angle like that. And uh, the gamma, is it's a simple fact. Okay, great. Now, uh, if we can, if we attack the full nonlinear problem, of course, the space time can be very different from Minkowski space. But the idea of asymptotical flat space time is very easy. Is that when you're going far away, it flies, space looks asymptotically flat uh, and looks to leading order like that, plus small corrections, which become smaller and smaller as you take distance to be large. The way to make it a bit more precise is uh, first let me introduce, again, it's, I'll introduce it. I don't know if it will survive uh, next uh, well, years of development, but until now it was a useful gauge. So if you have a space time to, at any point, or you can choose the coordinates of this type. Um, Plus, write it like this, R square GAB. Um, so this is just uh, motivated by metric above, but it has nothing to do with flat space yet. It's just a gauge which you can choose at any point, and it's called a boundary gauge. So here, the coordinates are, uh, are U, R, and uh, two coordinates on the sphere, similarly as here. And more, moreover, so if you fix a point on the sphere and you consider U equal constant, this again null. Uh, it's a null, null direction. So as here, fixed, uh, fixed angle and fixed U, it's a, it's a null. Subspace. Now, uh, to make uh, things more interesting, we ask us the following question. Okay, this is just a gauge. It's always true. So what do we call asymptotically flat space time? Well, w what, we, what we have to do is we have to figure what happens when R goes to infinity. What happens to the metric? And uh, what happens to the leading order is easy to guess. It's just uh, you, get, uh, you get the same formula, Minkowski space. So you get uh, DS Minkowski, let me write it. But now the question, what happens next? And uh, in general, to figure out correct fall-offs, um, well, I haven't tried, but uh, the lore is that it's a state of art because you have to basically figure out what are the correct fall-offs which allow for non-trivial physics, but also ex exclude um, uh, sick physics like infinite energy excitations. Etc. And uh, in the context of, uh, say, four-dimensional symptotically flat space times, this uh, fall-offs were work out correctly in the 60s by Bondi and Sachs and friends. And uh, let me write the answer. So now, 
here, this is just a gauge, but here the physical insight already enters. Because now I'm taking the R to infinity limit, and I think of R as approaching null infinity, and I'm saying to you, what is the, what is the behavior of fields in these limits? And here are how the people talk about them. So first, there is a correction of this type, mb over rdu square. This is called mass aspect, related to, in a sense, to mass of a space-time, but you will see in a second. So at this line, it will be a little bit that you, if you want to read these papers, you just have to accustom yourself with this. This ingredients, that's are the objects that people discuss when they talk about asymptotically flat space time. Then there is this uh, uh, CZZ tensor, uh, and this will be related to radiation. So CZZ is related to radiation. It doesn't have its name, but its derivative has a name. So NZZ, which is equal to derivative with respect to U of CZZ, that has its own name, and it's called new tensor. Okay, so we have this. Uh, then uh, there is a term of this type. And now we will discuss one more piece, which is subleting, one more subleting in uh, R, which has this form. Um, probably the longest formula I will ever write. Plus complex conjugate. Okay, so that's, uh, that's uh, uh, the expansion of the metric at large R. And here are the main players, so it's mass aspect. It's a new tensor or CZZ, and uh, and this uh, this thing here is called the uh, angular momentum aspect. Yes, please. Sorry. The bracket uh, uh, the bracket closed for CC ah. Yeah, close here. <laughs> there is no bracket, sorry. Oh, there is a bracket, yes, 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 yes. It's uh, here and it close here, yeah. Um, so it's, it just refers to CC, that, it, that you have to take complex conjugate of CCC, yeah, thanks. Okay, so, uh, sorry? This is, a, this is a derivative with respect to u. And the important, uh, important uh, uh, thing is that because it's an expansion at large r, all these fields, they're just a function of uh, all, all these fields. Uh, let me write them phi, a function of u, z, and z bar. So they, uh, they only depend on the point on the sphere and uh, this time. Okay, very good. So. Yeah, very, yes, thank you. So now uh, we have, uh, we have, uh, uh, this, is a, this is a sphere, so we're playing with the metric on a sphere. So this uh, uh, calligraphic Ds, they refer to covariant derivative on a two sphere. What is this metric? Now, uh, now we do the following thing. So let's now uh, write uh, the, uh, the equations of motion. Or, okay, let me uh, maybe uh, do uh, first uh, another thing. So, f so far I haven't uh, used the equation, the Einstein equations, I haven't, uh, haven't wrote. Um, now uh, let me, uh, Okay, let me write, yeah, let me write equations of motion so, so that we get a bit of a intuition about what's going on. Um, and, uh, 
is to understand a little bit, uh, to, understand, to, have a, to have some physical intuition about uh, what are these objects, uh, what do they mean. Uh, it's, uh, let us consider, for example, these equations of motion, the Einstein tensor, some matter, u, u component, and we expand it at large r, and we get uh, the following equation, du of mb is equal to one quarter of mzz plus t2 z bar and z bar z bar. Yep. This one? Yeah, notice, uh, notice that the sphere, uh, sphere has R square in front of it in the Minkowski space. Oh, yeah. And here, uh, this is the equation, and uh, here the stressor, stress tensor TUU is defined as a, is equal to 1, 4, NZZ, NZZ plus the limit of the matter stress tensor. Okay, what does it mean? Uh, well, TUU, you can think of TUU as a, a flux of radiation through null infinity. It has two pieces. If you have some massless particles, you have a flux of massless particles. Um, which is equal to this. And NZZ square is a flux due to gravity waves. So this is a, this is a gravity waves. That's why this, uh, news, this news tensor is related to gravity wave and it has its own name. Now you can, uh, uh, there is a famous, famous equation, which is um, if you integrate this formula on the sphere, let's integrate it over the sphere we get du integral d to z, gamma z, z, r, mass aspect. And uh, this is just total divergence. It integrates to zero. And you get the formula that this is um, uh, and notice that TUU, uh, if, uh, if the, the, the energy, so this is the energy of the matter which is positive, and this is a square of also, it's an energy of gravity wave, so TUU is positive definite. So we get that the change of the integral of MB is negative along the U. So it's monotonic along SCRI. And this, this formula called bond mass loss formula If you wish, the picture is that you have a spacetime with some mass, which is ADM mass. Uh, the integral of bondi as aspect here at minus infinity is equal to ADM mass. And as soon as you evolve forward in the future, your spacetime loses its energy because it radiates it away. And the change of your mass is negative definite because radiation carries energy away. That's a, that's a picture. So if you wish, so mass aspect is the density of this integral, it is not uh, uh, positive definite anymore. Uh, and it has this energy flux part. And in the discussions of soft theorems, etc., this part is called hard part because you can really measure it. And this piece is called usually soft part. Because, it, well, it integrates to zero and it will be related to the subtle memory-like effects which we discussed in the lecture. Now, uh, that's very, uh, very simple. And now let's uh, get uh, the first, say, um, uh, non-trivial conditions or set of conservations laws and uh, um, by noticing the following. Yeah. 
Yes, yeah, so um, uh, it's an excellent question. Uh, if we write Einstein equations, we will find that uh, there, are, uh, uh, there are relations between those. And uh, so n, n z is completely un, un, unrestricted. You can take it whatever you like. And then for uh, there are extra data, which is integration constants. And there are integration constants uh, for mass aspect. There is an integration constant for CZZ. And there is an integration constant for angular momentum aspect. So uh, I, will, I will come to that. Um, and there is a similar equation for, uh, there is a similar equation for uh, DU and Z. Let me write it so that um, have it on the board for a while. Again, you uh, you can do it yourself if you if you plug plug this ansatz in Einstein equations. You can check these formulas. There are there are also subleading terms which are important. This is sometimes confusing in the papers because in the papers it's written this plus dot dot dot, but actually to get things right you have to write some little bit of dot dot dots. Uh, to add these components. Sorry, okay, so let me finish this. Um, it's a question again similar, um, similar to the one we wrote before. Um, uh, TUZ, it's again the same thing. It's related to angular momentum flux. You can show that TU, TUZ measures the flux of angular momentum. Again, you can uh, write it. Uh, there, is, uh, there is again the soft part. Well, there is also derivative of MB, but importantly, okay, you have this evolution equation for NZ. So what is the data after you plug all these equations? What is the data that specifies the solution? Well, uh, let me write it. It's uh, you take n and the z as a function of u, z, and z bar, and you take uh, integration constants for um, say if you wish c z z at i plus minus m b at i plus minus and z at i plus minus. So these are, uh, these are first order equations. We have three first order equations. This one, this one, and this one. They are all specified in terms of uh, NZZ, but they have integration constants. So these are these three integration constants, and this is a new tensor which specifies the radiation. That's a, that's a phase space. Uh, if you go to higher orders, I think it's an open problem, again, in, as far as I know, in relativity to figure out if it's all the data, if everything in subleading terms related to that, or there are some new tensors. I think it's, maybe it's believed that that's all you need if you go to higher orders in R. Now here comes, uh, 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 by the way, I'm leading you in, with a, not the usual path. Usual path is that we have a symmetries, and then we derive the conservation laws. But in this, uh, in this subject, it happens that it's easier, actually, to first find the charges and conservation laws, and then figure out what the symmetries are. And uh, that's what we will, uh, well, we are one step away from this infinite number of new conservation equations. Yep. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say so. So this, are some, uh, this is some date, soft data, this function on the sphere. It's not a number, actually. It's not a number, yes, sorry. This is, uh, because we are on the boundary, it's not a function of u, but it's a function of, of, of on the sphere. So it has these three functions. Yeah, yeah. Or scry minus one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, uh, I think that's uh, the current picture. 
I don't know if it's, it's not Ethereum as far as I know. But. Yeah, the boundary, and then you integrate it with the news. So. Yeah. Well, it's actually far from I zero because this, but yeah. On a picture, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So you specify the three integration constants and then you integrate along with the n, the z, and the constraint equations. Questions? Okay, now we will uh, do the step, uh, the glorious step of getting infinite number of, of conser new conservation laws. So, Um, and this uh, step is, uh, as we, uh, as again, I tried to explain a little bit in this toy model. Now, you can ask, okay, we, we have our uh, Penrose diagram, we identify the fields, the NZZ is a radiation. Uh, what happens, what are the asymptotic properties of the fields as they approach boundaries of scry? If I ask you, if I give you some system, uh, nonlinear equations with some matter, it's, it's a non-trivial question. And, uh, well, in uh, particular in Strominger's paper, or it seems to re a uh, result which pops out in this discussion is a result uh, by Christodoul and Kleinerman. It's, uh, I, I know almost nothing about it, but so this is some rigorous, rigorous theorem about st nonlinear stability of uh, Minkowski space, the idea is that, that if you take some Cauchy data which is finitely but small, close to vacuum, it all disperses to null infinity and you don't form a black hole. But also they figure out, apart from that, the fall-offs fall -offs of the, these fields. In particular, you can ask, how do we know that uh, if I take the limit of these fields on the scry, when u goes to zero, it is that limits exist. Maybe, maybe it blows up, maybe these fields blow up as we take u to infinity. So in a paper by Strominger, he referred to this paper, this result from this theorem, where they show that, say, a new stensor, uh, it falls fast enough that you can integrate it, and these limits exist. As far as I know, this, this is only, say, this, you can refer to this Christodoulou Kleinerman only to show that this guy exists, this CZZ guy. They, even uh, the, the, this thing about mass aspect is just a conjecture again because you see that it uh, works. You, you assume that it exists, then you do some trick and you get some, some uh, relations which happen to be correct when you check them. So it suggests that this is a correct picture. But uh, say, moreover, then another stretch is, okay, Klistadun Kleinerman is for space time without black holes, but again, this picture seems to be correct even in the presence of black holes. So maybe this Christodoulou Kleinerman, I don't know what's its role at the end. Maybe that's just a correct thing, correct way to think about scattering and uh, it's uh, extremely hard to prove it in some, with some mathematical rigor. Anyhow, so with a small uh, digression about this uh, famous result, we get this data. Moreover, we believe that these limits exist and now uh, the idea is that, uh, well, if we have a scattering problem, uh, we believe that, say, if there are some symmetries here, there are some symmetries there, there are generators of symmetries, there should be some match along this point I note. There should be some match uh, of the fields. And uh, the idea is that the correct matching is this antipodal matching in Scry. So as we write before, now we, we write the following things. That mass aspect z z bar at i plus minus is equal i minus plus, where important important points that these coordinates which I choose on the sphere they're antipodal. So you take uh, if you take a point z here, if you paint, take a point on the sphere in the North Pole on this part of the equation. The same point z and z bar in this coordinate on scry minus corresponds to the south pole. So you identify fields with a flip. Is that uh, clear? 
what's, uh, what are we imposing? So we are matching this integration constant here and here with a flip, which is very non-intuitive. Um, and uh, you can ask, okay, how is it possible? We have a completely smooth date on spatial slice. How is it possible we have a flip? Well, it's possible that these points are really not close to each other. You should not think of them as close to each other. You have some smooth data, you take some limits, and you get this picture. So as soon as you have this equation, uh, we get an infinite number of new of conservation laws, as you will see now. And the second, uh, second equation that we will write is related to uh, the same type of identity for all other three for all three constants. So we have the same thing we have uh, for NZ. Again, with a flip. And the same here for CZZ. There are some minus signs involved, but I choose a convention such that there are no minus signs in the, in the flipping. Now, uh, Let's uh, see what are the consequences of this identification. To get to it, it's very simple. Uh, let me introduce some hindsight. The conservation charge. Two set of conservation charges. So one conservation charge, QF, corresponds to integral over the sphere of, with some function, arbitrary function. So it's labeled by a function. Um, and here we have mass aspect zz bar at i plus minus. And this conservation charges will be super translation conservation charges. Super translation. I haven't explained why. So far, just we, we are following the, the road of charges. And uh, the second set is the same thing, but with the angular momentum aspect. So you take some vector field, and you integrate gamma z z bar, uh, angular momentum aspect. So this is uh, another set of charges. Uh, why do I call them? Uh, why do I call them conservation charges? Well, let's uh, let's integrate let's integrate this equation with some function f and with some vector field y. Um, now, notice that we can use uh, uh, the integration by parts and write uh, simply, we can write, um, for example, here, we can rewrite it as an integral over scry plus of du, du and b the minus sign, so here was a uh, minus mb i minus minus. So what I did here is simply integrated, integrated by parts if you wish. So I rewrite, this is a total, this is the integral of total derivative, it's equal to the difference of its boundary values. This is a one boundary value, and the second boundary value I just subtract. Right? So, start with these charges, and then I rewrote it as a total derivative. Okay, now we are getting, uh, and now for this, for this total derivative, we can use Einstein equations. Exactly this. And uh, for this term, imagine that we start we consider space-time where it starts in a vacuum, so mb is zero, and it ends up in a vacuum where mb is zero. Consider space-time like that. This term is then zero. 
Now we do we do the same thing we do the same thing on the on the left hand side and we use again equation equations of motion for for MB. How much time do I have? Okay, perfect. Now uh, this has uh, um, if you do this for this equations and for this equations, this is what is called. Uh, this infinite number of conservations law for super translations. This is this, and this is for called super rotations. What is the meaning of this conservation laws? Well, let me first discuss super translations. So we're doing this procedure. We get the following identity. We get that the integral of this right hand side. No, it's absolutely arbitrary, yes. Um, so, we get that the integral of this thing on scry plus is in equal to the same integral. With an, again, as antipodally matched point on the sphere on the scry minus. So this is a crucial point. Now, what is the meaning of this thing? Um, let me explain. Uh, let me write first the same thing here. So this is a flux of energy in y minus and y plus. If you choose uh, f, uh, if you choose f, say to be constant, this is just a consideration of total energy. This term integrates to zero, and then we get that the total flux of energy through scry minus is equal to total energy flux of scry plus. Yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you. This is a, it's it's. Yes, I'm sorry. It's absolutely crucial. Yes, it's yes. There is a dv. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So now this uh, this fields uh, the functions of u and z. And uh, if you take uh, f to be uh, its lower. Uh, Harmonics on a sphere, say if you take a constant, is just the conservation of total energy and total momentum. This piece drops out, and you get uh, that uh, total energy is equal to total momentum. Now the idea is that uh, what we have arrived is that um, uh, is a new set of identities which uh, express some uh, conservation, but for any function of f. Sometimes this, this thing is called, um, for example, let, let, me choose, let me choose f to be a delta function on a sphere. Then uh, sometimes this is called energy conservation at every angle. Um, this might be confusing because uh, how can energy be conserved at every angle? You would say consider a scattering of two particles like that, which end up being like that, and measure the energy flux somewhere here or somewhere here. Clearly, energy flux is not conserved. So this part is different for on the point on the sphere. However, the point is that uh, this integral of um, N, notice that we, if we, for, for this part, we can do this integral over U, and it will become just CZZ. So it will become the soft mode. <coughs> because remember, uh, remember that uh, we can plug for NZZ DU CZZ, and then we can just do this integral. And we will get this, uh, this soft mode. So the idea is that uh, uh, the change in the energy flux 
at every angle in uh, antipodal MH spheres is uh, exactly uh, compensated with this change in the Coulombic, Coulombic field, which you can measure with a memory. So the way I um, find useful to think about it is that you say that energy, uh, energy, energy flux is not conserved at every angle, but it's remembered. If you take a flux plus memory in the, in the past, it's equal to flux plus memory in the future, along with every angle. Um, so that's, uh, that's what is, uh, say, this super translation conservation is about. Um, yeah, any questions? And so far, uh, you should be, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah, here's a charge, you see it's called dimension two because it's a gauge theory. So in, in the quantum field theory, the question is in the quantum field theory is a charge is a defined in co-dimension one. Here we have the sphere, where the charge is given by the value of the field on the sphere, or integral on the sphere, which is co-dimension two. But this is because it comes from a gauge, gauge theory. The simplest example of this type that you can have in mind is consider a particle which is freely propagating through flat space. They just go from minus infinity to plus infinity. In this case, uh, this change in the, uh, in the memory will be trivial, it will be zero, and then you see that the flux of energy on antipodal matched points on the sphere, because if you start with some point, if you start with the south pole, and you then propagate forward, you will end up in the north pole, so then uh, this becomes trivial. So that's, you can consider your favorite example and, uh, and see that it works. I'm, I'm afraid that I confused everybody. So uh, please ask me questions if you. Yeah. Um, so if you remember, we, uh, uh, we discussed in the first lecture this model where it was age. So this, and the, so this if, to connect to the previous lecture, just think of CZZ as being age. And then you integrate NZZ, you get delta CZZ, which is delta H. So it's a memory. And this is uh, the centipedal matching that we discussed for age. Now you can write exactly the same, exactly the same identity for this second set of charges using this equation. And again, making, uh, you will get uh, something which uh, looks like a relation between fluxes of angular momentum. And again, uh, this type of expression, it has hard part, which is this, which is really if you put a colorimeter and you measure the flux, you will measure this, and it has a soft part, which is uh, something that will be uh, measured as some time type of residual deformation in the detector. For example, this for this guy, you can measure it as some clock desynchronization, but there are many other ways to measure that. But anyhow, so this, um, the philosophy here is always that this new conservation laws that generalize the existing ones, like en energy conservation and momentum conservation by including the soft piece. Now, uh, um, I, that's, um, that's a picture. Now, uh, notice that I haven't, I call them super translation and super rotations, and I call them charges, and I call them symmetries, but I haven't explained uh, why is that. And, uh, well, that's uh, for the sake, so actually for the, I found that, uh, uh, be more pedagogical, but um, yeah, I shouldn't have erased it. The idea would be now this: if you uh, if you 
if we call them charges, so what kind of symmetry they generate? That's the next question I would like to ask. So we identify infinite set of quantities which conserved. We can use them to constrain the data. Given if you know something, you you know uh, if you know something on square minus, you know something on square plus. And uh, the next uh, step, which I was going to explain, is uh, okay. We miraculously, in hindsight, identify the charges. What are the symmetries that they correspond to? And we will find that these are indeed the charges, and they do indeed generate asymptotic symmetries. That's uh, uh, that's the idea. And uh, moreover, if you assume, well, with a, if you assume that these charges commute with the S matrix, if you imagine now some quantum theory of scattering, and uh, you assume that they commute, again, maybe for, uh, for super translation, you can try to relate to some ADS, ADM Hamiltonian and, um, argue for this, but for super rotation, basically I think this is an assumption again. You assume that these things commute. So if you assume that, if you consider this as a charges and you assume that they commute, and then you sandwich these identities into some in and out, between some in and out states, you will recover soft theorems. That's a connection to soft theorems. And this way you get uh, these charges, which are conserved, they have a flux of energy, which is familiar, they have this memory part. If you sandwich them between the S matrix, they generate soft theorems. That's, uh, and this is a, uh, notice that's completely fully nonlinear analysis of Minkowski space. We don't, so we jumped from the linear simple problem to fully nonlinear problem. Not, there is no approximation here. Okay, if there are no questions, I would, uh, I would like to, in a five, or let's go. Ah, no, no, if I just, I lost the track of time. It's, ah, we started at uh, 2.30, so yeah, okay, I should, I will finish in a minute. Uh, okay, so now, in principle, I would have to explain, uh, I would like to explain two more things. And uh, I will explain them then partially in the next lecture, is that, well, one thing is that uh, this in, uh, a bit unusual, unusual thing from charges to symmetries, from charges to asymptotic symmetries. So we will find that we introduce the notion of asymptotic symmetries uh, and then uh, uh, try to find the charge that generate them. We will find that this are they, uh, this are those, and then uh, uh, from another second piece is that from these charges to uh, familiar soft theorems, because uh, you, if you think about scattering amplitudes, you're used to think in momentum space. Here, everything in coordinate space. And so to go from these charges and coordinate space to usual um, soft theorems, uh, there is this sort of LSZ procedure, Lehman, Simonczyk, Zimmerman in, uh, in coordinate space. So this is, um, these are two things I will explain next time. Thank you.